Alrighty, hi, hope you're well. Um, it, we are rate right up on your first test for Phil 103 online, winter uh, 2016. Um, so, uh, it, what I'm going to do here is record a brief video that goes over the structure of the test and what's expected and how best for you to engage uh, with this first of your assignments. Um, first thing you'll find is the due date, which is Monday, February 8th by 5 p.m. Um, the test is already posted to Moodle, so I mentioned in here you will have at least five days to engage with this test material. Your responses should be submitted to Moodle. No late assignments. Um, so um, everything at the top here is boilerplate. Uh, I go over um, basically you're going to have three tests. Um, this is the first of them. Uh, each test will engage two theorists, uh, in this case Socrates and Aristotle. Um, so uh, basically I divide it into two sections. One is um, a, a short answer section where I ask you about key terms, uh, make a distinction, that sort of thing. Uh, these are a little bit on the shorter side. Uh, and then uh, the second part is a longer answer question um, which requires between three to five paragraphs. A paragraph is three sentences, so it's a little bit more of a sustained engagement and in this case it's a comparative question. So um, that's what the um, assignments are for. Um, I will point out that everything that we've, we've engaged with in, in, as part of the core material of this course, including my videos on this material, including the supplements um, that I posted for you uh, for this material, including the readings, everything that's, that's core to the course is fair game for these tests. Um, I've tried to go fairly straightforward um, with this material, um, but if you have any questions, uh, send me an email. Um, watch this video. I'll try to address um, a lot of the questions and direct you to kind of where you should um, look uh, with regard um, to this. Uh, missed assignment policy. Basically, this, this requires that you have a conversation with me if you're going to miss an assignment, um, either before or within 12 hours of um, the deadline or due date question. So um, February 8th, um, contact me by February 7th to let me know um, that if, if the skies fall in, if something horrible has happened and you're just plain old not going to be able to make the deadline, we'll be able to work something out. Uh, the reason I have this policy is so that, um, you see, with these, uh, after you submit and when I turn to grading them, um, I post a model answer and I can't post that model answer or start grading until I have everything that I'm going to get for these assignments because um, effectively these are take-home assignments, right? So you've got the videos, you've got your textbooks, you've got your notes, you've got the internet, you've got all the resources in the big bad world out there for you. Um, I can't also give you the answers to this, right? So um, I need to know I've got another assignment coming in um, if it's going to be coming in, right? So um, it, so it, like by 5 a.m. on the 9th, I, 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 first thing in the morning on the 9th, I need to be able to get ready to grade if I'm going to be able to get ready to grade. So, um, and extensions require conversation, right? Um, assignment submission, it's your responsibility to make sure it's uploaded to Moodle. Um, in these online courses, I frequently have students that just kind of go dark or don't submit an assignment, don't intend to submit an assignment. And um, I can't be chasing after you. Um, you're adults, um, so it's um, make sure that um, you submit your assignment uh, properly to Moodle. So du double check after you click submit. Um, and if you're worried about it, uh, email me as well. Um, so basically what you'll be doing is uploading documents to Moodle. Um, so uh, that's that's the way this will shake out. Um, note also the policy on plagiarism for this. Um, since it's open book and since you've got internet resources in addition to videos, in addition to the textbooks, um, et cetera, et cetera, since you've got everything in the world that's a resource for you here, if it's not coming from your own reflections, you have to acknowledge that 
Um, it's, it's, I've been teaching this for a long time, so I know what resources uh, you're likely to find out there. And uh, I've, I've read them. So um, it, the thing is, you're allowed to use things outside your own reflections. You just have to say, hi, I'm using this thing outside my own reflections. I have a 33 page paper here that I'm currently working on. This is page 33. I'm on footnote number 63, right? So um, it's perfectly fair to use outside resources. You just have to tell people that you're using something that you, you didn't think up yourself. Otherwise you're claiming credit, effectively stealing that, right? So um, uh, for these questions, I, I prefer your own reflections on the basis of the core material, like what you've understood. Um, and this is a, a sort of a, 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 an exercise in developing precise language more than anything, right? To communicate ideas. Um, as is the, the, the sort of core sort of learning outcome for the course here. So um, two sections, uh, short answer and longer answer. Uh, the readings are Plato's five dialogues, the Apology and the Credo. Uh, so that's just two of these five. Um, and then Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And that's just books one, two, and the first section of three um, that we went over. You've got accompanying videos from me. So, um, and a whole lot of supplementary material. I listed here the Socrates video. That's my video on Socrates. Uh, Rick Roderick, uh, Socrates in the Life of Inquiry, Philosophy Guide to Happiness, Socrates on Self-Confidence, um, Grant Yoakum, Aristotle Ethics, uh, that's my video on uh, Aristotle, um, Aristotle's Ethics Part 1 from uh, the University Podcast Lectures and School of Life Philosophy Aristotle. Right. So um, those are all of your video resources. Uh, this is the core content for the course. So you're expected to have screened all of this in addition to having um, read the relevant sections of the texts. And if you've done that, you should be fairly well armed uh, for engaging with these questions. Um, so part one, um, these are short answer questions requiring three, uh, between three and five sentences for each response. Uh, by sentences, I mean full sentences, point form re responses are far too vague to serve as acceptable. Problem is with a point form response, I know what you're getting at because I designed the question for you to get at it. And if you give me point form, I wind up supplying a lot of what's necessary in making a rational, cogent and communicative attempt to get across this idea. Uh, but that's your job because you're supposed to be developing the facility of language um, to communicate these ideas, right? even to people who don't know the material. So anyone should be able to pick up your, 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 your questions and figure out what's going on with your responses, right? So just make it clear, 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 right? Um, so um, two points each, total of 10 points. Uh, I want two uh, Socrates questions and three Aristotle questions here. And I tried to pick um, the most central of the notions um, that we've studied. I've got a crying baby in the, in the other room. My, my partner's on it, so it's all good. This is, this is one of the drawbacks of doing this stuff from home. Um, so first question, Socrates presents us with an epistemological um, theory of knowledge position in which we are only able to make a negative claim to knowledge. Why is Socrates the wisest man in Athens? Because he alone knows that he knows nothing. And he's making a more general claim than that. Um, in uh, the Socrates moral position uh, video that I've posted for you, Okay, where is it here? Where is it here? Do, 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 do. Here it is, page 27, towards the bottom, uh, where after he's done the entire investigation, leading him to the conclusion that he must be the wisest man in Athens, and it's sort of a funny way that he's the wisest. Um, he sums up by saying, what's probable, gentlemen, is the fact uh, is uh, that, in fact, the God is wise and that his auricular response meant that human wisdom is worth little or nothing. And that when he says, this man, Socrates, he's using my name as an example, as if 
He said, this man among you mortals is wise as who, like Socrates, understands that his wisdom is worthless. So, can we know the big T truth? No. No, we can't know the big T truth. We can make a negative claim. We can know that we don't know. Right? That's the only positive claim to knowledge that we can make, and it's actually a negative claim. However, Socrates is able to make a positive claims that stem from this negative claim to knowledge. Positive moral claims. Right? This is what I think is one of the most clever things about the argument in the Apology. I, I discuss it in that video that I gave you. Discuss the intellectual movement from epistemology, theory of knowledge, to ethics, which makes this possible. Right. Like I say, I give you a whole video that goes over this position, so that your goal is to sort of sum that up in a paragraph. That's the first question. Number two, um, in his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, Socrates introduces the distinct but related notions of the social contract and tacit consent. Define each of these notions distinguishing between them. Right. So, um, one question on the Apology, one question on the Credo. Uh, this is sort of the big movement in the Credo. Right? Here is an agreement. Well, how did I agree? Well, this way. Right? So, um, more or less, uh, this is it, it, the big sort of interesting linchpin mo movement um, in uh, the Credo there. Right? So, I just want to see that you get that. Right? So, define each and see how they work together. Right, um, it distinctly but relatedly. Right. Now, on to Aristotle. Briefly discuss the function argument as discussed by Aristotle in Book 1 of the Nicomachean Ethics. How, by this argument, does Aristotle arrive at a definition of happiness? I give you the example of the beer store guy, but keep in mind that Aristotle is looking for something more general than the simply task specific kind of examples that I'm giving you there. Right? He wants to isolate a generally human function. So what is it that's distinct in particular about humans that can serve as a function? And then how does this function argument lead to a definition of happiness? Right? Happiness, a condition of flourishing. Right. Remember Aristotle's metaphysics, right? the movement from acorn to oak tree, uh, potential to actual kind of thing. It's at work here, too. So, um, anyhow, first question. And this is really the linchpin of Aristotle's argument. It's how he's able to make any of the other claims that he's able to make about ethics. Right. Uh, question four. In book two, the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle defines virtue of character and discusses how it's developed. So, what you should do is define virtue of character and briefly discuss how it's developed. All right. Fairly straightforward, right? Two points, definition, development, right? Um, just like uh, the, the function argument. Um, do, 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 do. Discuss the function argument. How does this lead to the idea of happiness? Or the definition of happiness? And then, finally, number five in Aristotle, and um, there's a whole particular video that I've, I've made for you for this um, as well. In paragraph 13 of book three, section one of the Nicodemian Ethics, so the first thing that you should do is turn to uh, book three of the Nicodemian Ethics. Where is it here? Du -du 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 -du. Book three. Um, section 1, here we go, Preconditions of Virtue, Section 1, Paragraph 13, oh, here it is, everything that's caused by ignorance is non-voluntary. Ah, there's an interesting term. All right, so in Paragraph 13 of Book 3 of Section 1 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle draws a distinction between what he calls non-voluntary and what he would, uh, uh, he would call properly involuntary. How are these types of action distinct? Part one, right? So distinguish between the non-voluntary and the involuntary. And why does Aristotle bother to make this distinction? Now, um, just because I'm a nice guy, I'm going to point out to you that um, everything caused by blah, 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 that's on your page 31. Over to page 32, you'll see a little asterisk there. I've got it circled in red. 
Well, every time there's an asterisk, and I believe it's, yep, page 203, uh, there is a footnote at the end of the book, and this one is so important that I've made my own asterisk in the corner, right, and underlined elements of it. It's a great footnote and explains this distinction for you, as I do in the video material. So, um, I think it's important. Right? It marks Aristotle's position with regard to ethics off as different from what we're about to see in the next section of the course. So it's, it's an important distinction because when we turn to the moderns, we're only concerned about the morality of the action. Aristotle's digging for something more fundamental than that. Right, um, as he says, good people who do fine actions. That's that's what this treatment is supposed to produce. Now, um, part two. Um, this is a little bit more involved. This is where you're going to have to do something a little bit more sustained uh, with this material. Um, this well, it's called a longer answer question. Longer answer questions require between three and five paragraphs in response. A paragraph consists of a minimum of three sentences. The goal for this section is to make a short argumentative account of the material at hand as directed by the question below, and it's one question and it's worth 10%. This is half your assignment. So, the question. In the Apology, it's clear that Socrates, by stressing the importance of moral reasoning, sets up a position that, in a way, uh, that in a way, uh, in a way that opposes reason to emotion. So you have reason over here, emotions over there. This is why Socrates notes that he's not bringing his sad wife and family to the courtroom, right? He's just speaking the truth, right? Why? Because the jurors, as all Athenians, should be persuaded by reasons, not by feelings, not by emotions, not by opinions, not by desire, by reasons. Right? We saw this come out in the Crito as well, right? where Socrates right, clearly wants to live, but is concerned with only the justice of the matter. I can dig that out for you. It starts with the words, the only valid consideration. Where are we here? Do, 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 do. Here we go, page 51. For us, however, since our argument leads to this, the only valid consideration, as we were saying just now, is whether we should be acting rightly in giving money and gratitude to those who uh, will lead me out of here and ourselves for helping with the escape, or whether, in truth, we shall be doing wrong in all this. Emotion doesn't enter into it. Okay? Desire doesn't enter into it. So that's that's it, it seems fairly clear that that's present in Socrates position there Simply we should be persuaded by reasons and not uh, by emotionally grounded opinions or bare beliefs So here's Socrates Aristotle on the other hand discusses emotions in, in, extensively and incorporates our disposition to our emotions into his account uh, as the foundation of virtue of character. What is virtue of character? It's a habitual disposition to our emotions resulting in states of character, that is, propensities to act evaluated in terms of the golden mean of moderation. I think I just answered one of your short answer questions for you. These two theorists have distinct estimations of the role of emotion for moral considerations. That's interesting. So, briefly introduce each of these positions, followed by a brief comparative account of these positions. Right. So, Socrates' position does this. Aristotle's position does this. If you like, take a position. Aristotle is superior to Socrates, or Socrates is superior to Aristotle. Right. Um, or, right, it, it, it talk about the completeness of the positions, right? Nonetheless, right? So basically what I want you to do is engage with these positions after introducing these positions. That's why it's a minimum of three paragraphs. Here's Socrates, here's Aristotle, here's my account, right? So um, that is your quiz. Um, 
it, give yourself lots of time for this because it's what you'll find if you do this at the last minute is that there are a lot of nuances here that you're going to have to engage with. So um, it, make sure you've got plenty of time um, to go over this material and think it through and construct your responses. Um, if the sky falls, let me know. We'll try to work something out. Make sure you submit properly. And if you're freaked out, send me an email with an attachment with your assignment there too. Um, better to be redundant, right? Um, and don't plagiarize finger wag, finger wag. Um, just tell me if you're using something outside um, your own head to answer this question, right? So, um, Anyhow, have good days, uh, one for each of you, and I look forward to reading your responses. Um, I think this is a fun section of the course. All right.